Election Lecture event discussing the Electoral College in, in a proposed reform, the National Vote, or the National Popular Vote Plan. We have two speakers for you today with differing perspectives on the Electoral College. Speaking first, we Mr. Pat Rosenstiel, Rosenstiel, uh, who will argue in favor of the National Popular Vote Plan. He's a senior consultant with the National uh, Popular Vote Movement. Uh, the National Popular Vote Plan uses a multi-state compact to agree to award the state's electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote, uh, regardless of who won the state's, uh, that state's popular vote. Working as a senior consultant for the National Popular Vote Plan is his passion. Full-time, he runs a strategic communications firm and works on the policy side, policy side full-time in Minneapolis. His first dog was named Jefferson, and he considers himself a uh, conservative. Second, we have Professor John S. Baker, who is Emeritus Professor of Law at Louisiana State University, and he will, quote unquote, defend the Electoral College. He graduated from the University of Dallas, University of Michigan Law School, and graduated with a PhD from the University of London. Professor Baker is a Fulbright Scholar who served as an Assistant District Attorney and argued in the Supreme Court. Professor Baker also teaches a one-week two-credit seminar on originalism in the Federalist Papers at Georgetown Law. This seminar runs from May 28th to June 1st. And if you're interested in this, contact Dean Sherman for approval, and you can use those two credits here at Duke Law. So we have two conservative speakers representing opposite sides of a views on the Electoral College. Please give both speakers a warm welcome. Thank you. I uh, guess I decided to stand up. Um, thank you, Dr. Baker. Thank you for having us, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Baker and I have uh, differing opinions on the Electoral College. Um, I am an ardent supporter of the state power, as it uh, is stated in Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution that leaves it to every state to determine how they want to award electors for the presidency, and national popular vote preserves that power and preserves the Electoral College. Um, we may have a differing opinion on whether or not electors ought to be um, awarded on the basis of the national popular vote or the current system that 48 states use, which is the state-based winner-take-all rule. Um, but both methods, the current system, the current method on a state-by-state -state basis of awarding electors and the national popular vote are equally constitutional, equally um, sort of uh, relevant and appropriate under the power that's granted to the state under Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution. So um, I think we need to talk about national popular vote from a constitutional basis. I think we need to understand that the Electoral College has nothing to do with how a state awards their electors. It has everything to do with the power that each state has to award their electors. Um, you're right that national popular vote is an interstate compact, right? Uh, national popular vote's constitutional basis comes from three provisions in the U.S. Constitution. One I've already talked about, which is Article 2, Section 1, that says each state shall appoint in a manner the legislature thereof will direct a number of electors. Okay, that wasn't by accident by the founders, right? After taking 30 votes over 22 days, the founders could not agree on a method from which they would dictate to the states or they could not agree on a method to choose the president, okay? And anybody who comes up here, the nice part about national popular vote and electoral college reform is we don't have to worry about what any of the founders wrote on their own. We don't have to worry about what might be said or not said in Federalist number 44, 45, 64, 68, or choose your number. We have to worry about what the founders actually wrote as a strict constructionist, which I am, who supported the confirmations of Judge Justices Alito and Roberts, I go by what the Constitution says, not by what professors think it says. And under Article 2, Section 1, all 51 jurisdictions are granted the plenary or exclusive authority to award electors on any basis they choose. Okay, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has had 11 different methods of awarding their electors since they've been a state. The current system of state-based winner-take-all rules was never considered, never talked about, never questioned, and never used 
frankly, in the first presidential election. It wasn't one of the 22 votes taken, or the 30 votes taken over 22 days at the Constitutional Convention, and it was never considered by the Founding Fathers. So the current system today is only consistent with the United States Constitution because 48 states have chosen to award their electors on the basis of who wins the popular vote in their states. Two states do it differently. Maine and Nebraska do it by a congressional district system that did not require a constitutional amendment because the appropriate constitutional approach to make these kinds of changes, if you're a strict constructionist and you believe what they wrote in the Constitution is by state-based action, so Maine and Nebraska passed state statutes to award their electors on the basis of a congressional district model. 48 states use the winner-take-all rule like the state of North Carolina, my home state of Minnesota, the next speaker's home state of Louisiana. We all operate under the winner-take-all rule. You will find that nowhere in the United States Constitution, nor will you find your right to vote for president in the United States Constitution. That was given to you by the states you reside in. Okay, some of the methods they thought about were direct election of the president. Right? James Madison wanted something that looked more like direct election of the president. The founders couldn't agree. It was not written into the Constitution. Alexander Hamilton wanted a system that looked much more like a king. Right? They couldn't agree on that. So after the 22 votes, the 30 votes over 22 days, right, they determined that they could not agree on a method. They patterned a system based on the ecclesiastical method of electing a pope the College of Cardinals, which you're reading about in the papers today, they said, we're going to have an electoral college and we're going to leave the power to provide the check of the federal magistrate to the state legislature because it is the sovereign body of government closest to the people. And we believe that states will act rationally to defend and advance their political, cultural, and economic influence and provide an effective check on the President of the United States. The reason they left it to the legislature is because it was the body closest to the people. The other reason they left it to the legislature, right, was because they didn't want a compliant Congress in the federal judiciary having a check on the President of the United States. It's an important principle of federalism. Now, if the distinguished professor comes up here and talks about federalism, Let's just have an understanding of what the definition of federalism is, right? Federalism has everything to do with where the power resides. It has nothing to do with how that power is used. National popular vote preserves the right of the state to award electors. If my home state of Minnesota goes in with their 10 electoral votes into this interstate compact, which is the other governing uh, piece of the Constitution, says states can enter into interstate compacts and form agreements to uh, advance their interests provided it doesn't impinge on federal uh, uh, authority, right? If my home state goes in with her 10 electoral votes, she can withdraw through a simple majority vote of our legislature, right? If she decides in future elections she wants to end presidential popular elections in the state of Minnesota and appoint a slate of electors, that's loyal to a favorite son like South Carolina did for Strom Thurmond when he ran as a Dixiecrat, made a little bit of sense, they can still do that, right? So national popular vote uses the state power under Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution and the Compacts Clause in Article 1, Section 10, and states agree through a sovereign vote of their legislature to join or withdraw from this interstate compact. The Supreme Court called this a plenary authority of the state, the exclusive authority of the state to award electors. Okay? When enough states totaling 270 or more electoral votes, a majority of the electoral college which guarantees the presidency under Article 2, Section 1, when a, a, a total number of states totaling 270 electoral votes are in this compact, those states agree in block to award their electors to the candidate who wins the most popular votes in all 50 states not who wins their state by one vote or a thousand votes or a million votes, but the candidate who gets the most popular votes in all 50 states. Does three things, right? Guarantees the presidency to the candidate who gets the most votes in all 50 states. And our most important national election, and I think that's okay and I think that's good. But the real thing that it does is it makes every voter in every state equally relevant to the president of the United States, and that's not the case under the current system. 
okay? I'm a conservative, I don't like change. I'm wearing a pair of shoes right now that I've had for seven years, okay? Just understand that about me. I certainly don't like change for change's sake, okay? The current system is an absolute disaster and it's a monstrosity. It does not work, it doesn't work in any presidential election. And this is coming from a guy who's got some experience in presidential elections, like real experience. Might not have as much in the books, but I got a lot out there in the real world deciding how to allocate resources in political elections and political campaigns, right? The current system for electing the president um, results in nine battleground states, with 41 states being wholly ignored, not just politically, but in polling by their commander in chief. Okay, if you look, if you were able to get one of these documents that I brought, and I'm sorry I didn't bring enough, but if you look at the second page of it, it will show you how the last presidential campaign was run. $978 million, almost a billion dollars in campaign resources were targeting voters in just nine states. I'm sorry, 12 states, okay? That means 38 states received zero attention from the candidates as they were seeking the presidency. If you look at the post-campaign events where the presidents actually spent their time, where the president spent his time and Governor Romney spent his time, you'll notice that post-convention, President Obama campaigned in just eight states, right? Governor Romney campaigned in just 10, okay? That means 40, four out of five voters living in 40 states were left on the political sideline when electing the president of the United States. That is a direct result of the current system. Now you'll see that North Carolina got three visits, right? There was this head fake like you guys were gonna be a battleground state based on the fact that North Carolina went for Obama in 2008. But it was pretty clear from the very beginning apparently to the Obama campaign that he was not gonna be able to make North Carolina competitive again. Right, which is why he did not campaign here, which is why he didn't spend his resources here. Okay, now if it was just about how campaigns got run, I would not have a problem. Or I might have a problem, but I wouldn't have as big of a problem with the current system. It has everything to do with how presidents govern. Okay, and if you don't believe that, ask my friend Tom Tancredo, who served in the United States Congress during the debate over a $978 billion entitlement program known as the Part D prescription drug benefit. Okay, now I know a little bit about that because my president, the conservative president who wasn't gonna spend a lot of money, broke arms on the floor of the Congress in order to pass Part D and spend $978 billion we didn't have. I know exactly why he did it. And he did it because he needed to keep a promise to the voters of the I-4 corridor of Florida that runs between Tampa and Ormond Beach or Daytona Beach, right? Because those were persuadable voters in persuadable battleground states, okay? And if we did not win Florida, we could not win re-election and we couldn't go on to fight and win the global war on terror and all the other things we need to do. No Child Left Behind was about what do minivan driving moms in and around Dayton, Ohio need to hear from their American president in order to have an education president. When oil spills happen in the Gulf, you don't hear much about them when they're lapping up on the shores of Alabama or your home state of Louisiana. But when that first tar ball hits a resort in Florida, Barack Obama's down there and his frog togs cleaning it up himself. Okay? We don't care about free trade agreements. We're free traders, meaning Republicans are free traders. When sugarcane farmers are worried about uh, Guatemala dumping sugar, we are the free trade president. But when we need steel quotas for Pennsylvania and Ohio battleground voters, we can't slap up that tariff fast enough, right? But beet farmers in my neck of the woods and cane farmers in your neck of the woods have no such protection from American presidents. Former Secretary of Agriculture, former Governor of the state of North Dakota. Right, his name's Ed Schaefer, he's a great guy. Loves North Dakota. Anytime there was a um, sort of question about interest between North Dakota, South Dakota, and Missouri on the Missouri River, as Secretary of Agriculture, he had to side with the state of Missouri because Missouri sometimes is battleground. North Dakota and South Dakota aren't. 
Okay? This is how American politics is run because of a system that doesn't belong. Okay? So if you're a voter, four out of five voters, or if you're a legislator, and we've briefed pretty much every legislator in this country, right? We've been at this for a little while. There's a very simple question around national popular vote. If you understand that it protects the state power and it's up to the legislature to determine what is in the best interest of their state, and that is why they have this power, what is in the better interest of the state of Minnesota, my home state of Minnesota, the national popular vote or this current system of winner take all rules, which is a state statute that doesn't serve our interests, okay? States have this power, this federalist power to award elective electors for a reason. They have it to maximize the political, cultural, and economic influence of their state and provide an effective check on the president of the United States. When four out of five voters are left on the political sidelines and 40 out of 50 states are ignored by the commander in chief when he's running for president, and anybody who thinks you don't make promises while you're running for president doesn't have enough experience in real world politics, right? You gotta ask yourself why 40 out of 50 states would defend this current system, and frankly, that's what we're asking every state. Today, the National Popular Vote Compact has nine states, nine jurisdictions that have passed our compact. We have 134 electoral votes, roughly half of the electoral votes required. We've passed 31 legislative chambers in 21 states. We've earned the support of 2,100 state legislators across the country, not by hoodwinking them, but by sharing with them the very real power they have to fix this current system and the very real problem there is with the current system when it comes to electing the President of the United States, right? So the question, and I will defer to my colleague for a little while, and I look forward to my opportunity to respond to anything he might say, but the voting question here today is not whether national popular vote is the best system ever invented for electing the President. The voting question is national popular vote in the better interest of your state, your country, than this current monstrosity, which leaves four out of five American voters on the sideline and allows American presidents to get transactional with persuadable audiences in battleground states. Don't be confused by anything else. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to return to Duke. I was here about two years ago on a panel on over uh, federalization of crime. First thing I want to do is congratulate this chapter as winner of the outstanding federalist chapter for this year. And based on all the events you've had, uh, two a week often, I guess routinely, that's quite impressive. And to get a good turnout at these various events. I also want to congratulate the National Popular Vote Movement. I mean, it has been an amazing movement about which very few Americans are actually aware. Their first press conference was only in February 2006. And to get to the halfway mark, which you've already heard they are, that's very impressive. So it could well be that before the next election, uh, we have this issue squarely in front of the American people and probably in front of the American courts. Now, it, it, I'm glad to be here with Mr. Rosenstiel. The last time I was debating a Democrat, and, and I've got to say that uh, Pat's arguments are much stronger than the last arguments that I heard. And, uh, but the NPV is good enough to have posted the Federalist Society uh, panel that we had at the National Convention on their website. It is an impressive website. Lots of resources I commend it to you. I want to make three points. First of all, I want to address the rationale that's been discussed here and the actual statute. Two, I want to talk about federalism because there are different definitions of federalism. And three, I want to talk about the problem of democratic majorities and the Electoral College. First of all, the rationale, and I take this, you've already heard it, but I'm taking it from their own website, the explanation of the national popular vote. Quote, the bill ensures that every vote in every state will matter in every presidential election. Now, they go on to say that the reason why this doesn't happen is because we have the winner-take-all system in all but two jurisdictions. And the argument is, as you've heard it, 
that the other states are ignored. Well, all of that's true. Is there a response? Is there a solution other than this? Yes. Every state could do what the other two states, Nebraska and Maine, do. That is, they could split their votes by congressional district. Well, why don't they? <laughs> because it's about the majority in a state. Every political majority in a state wants the power of having the majority go to their side. Interestingly, a number of Republicans have set out in blue states to change the electoral votes so that it is by congressional districts. Now, of course, they're only doing that, of course, in blue states. Now, the Democrats could go in red states and do that. But the reality is you have a tension between what national majorities want and what state majorities want. So on the, first two, on the second two points, the problem, winner take all, and the result could be changed. So my question is, why doesn't the national popular vote instead concentrate on having every state split their vote according to congressional districts? Well, for one thing, they would encounter opposition. Right now, they're not encountering much opposition. When I spoke on this in the state of Washington to a group like this in a law school, nobody, well, one person, I think, even knew that the national popular vote had passed their legislature. And that person didn't know what it was. OK, every vote counts. That was the other point. Well, and they have, they have a page on trying to refute this. If you want every vote to count in that sense, we will be counting for a long time. Do you, you remember Florida, 2000, the count? Okay. Every available lawyer from the Federalist Society on the one side and every available lawyer from everywhere else on the other side was in Florida. Multiply that by 50. Now, why do I say that? Despite all of the arguments that have been put put forward, I actually have some practical experience in recounts. I was involved in a Senate recount in Louisiana in 1996. And the original spread was 10,000 votes. And we knew there was voter fraud. But trying to prove it's very difficult. We got it down to about 5,000 votes, but we couldn't ever get it below. The reason you don't have more recounts now in the Electoral College system is that lawyers being practical know that unless there's a very slim margin, it is virtually impossible to change the result. Why? The reality is there is no vote count that is ever perfectly accurate. Remember hanging chads and all that business. If you go back and you recount in any place, even with no fraud, there are mistakes. There are mistakes. They happen. If you go to a national vote and you're attempting to determine what the national total is, then every vote really does count. So that if you can pick up a few thousand here and a few thousand there and a few thousand there, it adds up. So that the issue of accuracy and fraud become endemic. They go through all the states. And as a result, you have the potential of litigation in every state because every vote does count. OK. Two, I want to talk about the actual statute. You notice that Pat didn't mention the statute. And if you go to the explanation page, they have a one-sentence description, uh, three-sentence description, and then they have a page description. But instead of just reading what they say it will do, let's read what they actually say. Now, first of all, it is a compact. Okay. Now, the compact clause in the Constitution is in Article 1, no state shall without the consent of Congress, and then I put in the ellipse because there are several things, enter into any agreement or compact with another state. You may recall a little dust up we had in the mid-19th century called the Civil War. It was based on the Jeffersonian notion that this nation is a compact of the states. And if it were, really were a compact of the states, then you are free to get out of the compact. That clause is in there to prevent the US 
Constitution from being what it had been under the Articles of Confederation, a confederation. So the compact issue is very important. Now, they make the case that there are two cases from the Supreme Court, Virginia versus Tennessee, 1893, more recently the 1978 case of U.S. Steel versus multi-state tax. And especially in the latter case, there is language that gives them reason to believe that maybe the Supreme Court would allow this kind of a compact without actual congressional approval. Because there have been a number of compacts that have not had congressional approval, including the multi-state tax one. But there, it's always uh, difficult and dangerous to predict what the US Supreme Court will do. But there's certainly a strong argument that compacts that affect only two states or the parties within them are one thing. But language in the multi-state case suggests that whenever it affects the national government, and indeed this would affect the whole of the United States, that's a different matter. Now, to their political credit, after we argued this in November, at that argument, Mr. Coase, Dr. Coase, backed off and said, well, maybe, maybe we need to get, or we'll decide to get congressional approval. And there has been a bill, apparently proposed, to get congressional approval. But let's look more closely at the mechanics. I'm going to hit several points here from the language. Okay, the first part that I want to hit is under Article 3, manner of appointing presidential electors in, in member states. Prior to the time set by law for the meeting and voting of the presidential electors, the chief election official of each member state shall determine the number of votes for each presidential uh, slate, not in that state, but in each state. So we've got 51 chief election officials determining in all 51 jurisdictions what that vote is. Not one person, we got 51. You think that there might be differences of opinion as to what votes count? In 2000, how would Democrats and how would Republicans have scored Florida without litigation? Next point. The uh, chief election official designates the presidential slate with the largest national popular vote. So in the last election, if this had been in effect, and the state votes overwhelmingly for President Obama, but if Romney had won the popular vote, then the slate in California that lost is the slate that wins. Now, it is one thing to say that states have plenary power to choose how their votes are allocated. It is another thing to say that the state legislature can allocate votes to the loser in that state. Seems to me we might have a question under the election laws and the 14th and 15th Amendment about how you allocate votes. Three, there's supposed to be a final count of each member shall treat as conclusive. It's not clear how we're going to get this final count. They say that we are to respect the counts of every other state. I can imagine Republicans and Democrats who are chief election officers in different states having disagreements about this. Well, there was a mention that, that uh, states can withdraw. Well, let's look at this. Each member state may withdraw from this agreement except that a withdrawal occurring six months or less before the end of the presidential term shall not become effective until a president or vice president shall have been qualified to, to serve. Six months prior to the November election would be early May. Okay. Now, you know, the primaries and everything have been going on for a long time at that point. Strategies have been based on a certain uh, calculation of what the electoral votes will be. A state decides to drop out then. What does that do? Okay, well, let's not worry about that. Let's instead imagine that a state drops out after that. And they say, well, you can't drop out after that because you've agreed. Well, how do you force that agreement? Well, they say the contracts clause enforces it. Well, wait a minute. Somebody didn't do their homework on the contracts clause. Because the contracts clause has been variously interpreted over the 
over the many years of our Constitution. But there is a different approach where you can't later than the earlier ones, where states cannot be bound to give up their sovereign rights. So let's suppose that a Republican legislature has adopted the national popular vote, and a Democratic legislature comes in and says, we're out of here. How are they going to enforce that? They say you're bound by the Contracts Clause. No, the Contracts Clause has to do with the relationship between states and non-state entities. It is the Compacts Clause that is a contract clause among the states. A compact and a contract are the same thing. That is, compacts between states are contracts, and that is why they are governed by the federal constitution in terms of having Congress approve these. Now, the last point, there's always statements about this will not undermine the Electoral College. Well, the last part of Article 4 here says, this agreement shall terminate if the Electoral College is abolished. The reason that is in there, you could say, is merely a practical thing. The reason it is in there, as a matter of fact, is that this proposal, however well intended, is a suicide pact, compact. Why? It is a leftover of confederalism. That is, the whole business of confederalism was all about different states and getting together through a compact. That's what the Articles of Confederation were, a compact. They are treaties or agreements among states, international agreements. The, the debate between the Federalists, who wrote the Federalist Papers, and which Jefferson endorsed, and the Anti-Federalists was whether this would be this new entity called a federal government that the Anti-Federalists thought was, in fact, purely a national government. But the Federalist has a lot to say about this. Federalist 39 defines what our country is. It is neither in truth, says Madison, federal nor national. It is a compound of the two. It's something nobody had ever seen before. And that's what frightened a lot of the Anti-Federalists. It was not pure sovereignty, and it was not a confederation. What was it? It's not what many people call states' rights. There is a certain role for the federal government, and the balance of power is left with the state government. Some of that federalism that is described has been somewhat distorted because of the 17th Amendment. But interestingly, the presidency was particularly the um, point, uh, one of the points under the mixed compound where it was federal. That means that the states elected through the Electoral College. Now, the Anti-Federalists attacked the executive branch very strongly. But as Madison points out in the first paper dealing with the, uh, I think it was Hamilt uh, Hamilton, not Madison, in the first paper dealing with the executive, that the election of the president is the only point on which the Anti-Federalists thought they had done a good job. In other words, they were very much for the Electoral College. Now, the reason why today, people don't seem to understand a great deal about it is because they don't tend to understand a great deal about how our country was actually uh, framed in, in the Constitution. I knew we were in trouble in 2000 when on television, then Majority Leader Trent Lott was asked by some reporter uh, to explain the Electoral College. And he said, well, you know, I've never really been able to explain that to my wife. As Justice Scalia says, if people forget about federalism and what it's grounded in, it won't be preserved. So I'm out doing these things to, to let people understand there is a certain rationale to the Constitution in terms of federalism. And what we're talking about here, because the proposal cannot work, it will create chaos. And when the chaos occurs, there will be the continuing demand to have a national vote. And that will further centralize, centralize things. People will quickly understand that we will have to have a national official who is going to give a count, an authoritative count. You can't have 51 different elect, uh, officials deciding what the national count is. 
They have authority over the count in their states. They don't have authority over the count in the other states. More importantly, it is, it is that really the drive behind this, and all the states to this point who have approved this are blue states. The drive behind this is the notion of national majorities. But the reality is the way the Federalist was, explains it, we do not have a majority and a minority. We don't have big blocks. The whole teaching of Madison and Federalist 10 is about breaking up majorities. And you break up majorities by having multiple majorities. We have different majorities in each of the states. We have different majorities in the House. We have different majorities in the Senate. By design, that's why the Senate and the House often simply, even when in control of the same party, don't get along well together. The winner-take-all business reflects majorities in particular states. If you're focused on states, then the majorities in those states are free to either do winner-take-all or to divide it up in some other way. But when you get into the compact business, that's something very different. Much of the Federalists is devoted to the failure of early confederacies in the Greek nations. And they said the tendency was either to consolidate power under one of the members or for the whole thing to explode. The framers of our Constitution at the time were concerned that we would simply disintegrate, that we would break into three or more different confederacies and those confederacies would engage in war. They were very practical about what they did. Yes, they had certain theoretical elements, but they were engaged in a balancing act not to secure absolute democracy. Democracy, or what they called it then, republicanism, was a means to an end. It was a means to the end of liberty. But we have today many egalitarians on the left and many populists on the right who think that the more democratic things are, the better they are. Democracy as an end in itself. This is mass democracy. Chief Justice Marshall in the McCulloch case said, no dreamer would ever mass the entire American people into one body. Well, he didn't live long enough. There are plenty of dreamers out there today. They're the same kind of dreamers who told us about the Arab Spring and who today are lionizing some of them Chavez, what you don't want is an absolute majority and an absolute minority. That is the prescription for chaos and civil war. Thank you. Uh, where to start? Um, uh, thank you, Professor Baker. A um, couple of couple of things. Um, first of all, um, national popular vote doesn't um, result in one majority. We still elect our, you know, sort of um, state representatives, our members of Congress, our United States senators, and those all represent different kinds of majorities. So um, uh, let's just start there. Uh, congressional district system. Um, if we wanted to make every vote count, we'd go to a congressional district system. Shows a very lack of understanding about the realities in American politics. Um, if you look at the congressional districts in this country, um, 40 of them are competitive, 40 to 45 of them are competitive on a presidential basis, um, meaning that, uh, what does that leave? About 290 would not be competitive. We'd have 290 flyover congressional districts. It would all be about what the Mayo Clinic wants in Minnesota because that happens to be the first congressional district and the biggest influencer there. So the idea that a congressional district system would make every vote equal in every presidential election um, sort of calls into um, question a lot um, of the understanding. Uh, recounts, taking a long time under national popular vote. I guess that could be true if you wanted to ignore sort of the safe harbor clause. Um, there is a requirement that a, a president gets signed in. Um, the idea that there wasn't a certified count in Florida the day of the election that was the certified count um, makes me question um, sort of how deep into that recount process you were. Um, the certified uh, count of the Secretary of State was the certified count um, when the safe harbor date um, happened. Um, and I guess I'd go back and brush up on, on Bush v. Gore. 
Um, I do have some experience with recounts. I live in Minnesota, the land of 10,000 treatment centers and 10,000 recounts and 10,000 lakes. Um, I was a plaintiff in Rosensteel versus the state of the Minnesota, which was granted um, uh, cert in the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and my recount, my, my election came down to one vote. Um, so I have a little of experience there. There are five litigated recounts in 57 presidential elections because of the current system. 51 separate elections require you to do more recounts. In an average statewide recount, 294 votes change hands. Um, recounts happen one in every 185 statewide elections. Uh, there have been five litigated recounts in 57 presidential elections. Doesn't mean a recount isn't possible. Um, you ignore um, section six of Title Three of the U.S. Code, if you want to make a note, um, which requires 51 jurisdictions to provide certificates of uh, ascertainment to the archivists and the United States Congress. Um, those certificates of ascertainment report the popular vote total in every state and uh, the slate of elections that are certified based on the statute at that time. Um, we use the same system, certificate of ascertainment, chief election official of the state, there's a popular vote, you add it up and you award your electors based on who wins the national popular vote, not who wins your state vote. Calculators in all states work exactly the same way. Um, and uh, nobody has raised an issue that there will not be, can, nobody that I'm aware of that serious believes there can't be a count. Certainly won't come from Tom Brokaw or Fox News. Um, it'll come from uh, elected representatives of the people that are chief election officials. Um, let's see, compacts clause. We believe secession is a settled question. Um, you'll be happy to know that. Um, Not all 200, my students in Louisiana believe it's Right, a well, we, we believe it's a settled question. Um, still waiting for the supplies. 200, 200, 200, 200 years. 200 years of case law. Not a single, not a single state has been allowed to withdraw from an interstate compact based on the impairments clause of the United States Constitution in 200 years, more than 200 years of case law now. Not once in our republic has a state been able to withdraw from an interstate compact without following the rules of that compact. Not once. You're the law students. Um, you know, I believe this is America. There will be lawsuits. Every voter in the country will have standing, but the idea that this compact will not withstand the scrutiny, most of them will be dismissed summarily because Article 2, Section 1 is a plenary power of the state, and everybody recognizes that. Um, it was the Rehnquist Court, a very conservative court in the advance of federalism that said m many interstate compacts do not require congressional consent if they don't um, sort of um, uh, overlap with the power that's expressly given to the federal government. Uh, the most explicit state right, state power in the Constitution is Article 2, Section 1. That's why the Rehnquist Court probably would say we don't require congressional consent. Um, we are pursuing congressional consent. We always have been. Um, the last thing I'll say is the idea that, y you know, the end result of this is to, um, th that last thing you read about how the Electoral College, you know, if it goes out of existence, um, this no longer takes effect, it's because it's obvious that it wouldn't any longer take effect. Um, not because it's the stated goal. Um, you're looking at one supporter of the national popular vote that would oppose with all vigor a constitutional amendment um, to eliminate the Electoral College. This is the appropriate approach. Uh, the state-based approach is consistent with the mechanism provided within the Constitution. And uh, the Federalist Papers say nothing about a popular vote for president. They simply reinforce the state's power to award electors on that matter. So you guys are the students. You can do, um, you can dig into some of that stuff if you'd like. Okay, we've got some time for Q&A. We've got a question in the back ready to go. John, what's up? Uh, I have two quick questions. One is, how does the national popular vote deal with faithless electors? Insofar as if you're, if it goes after 270, one faith, faithless elector can really screw the whole thing up, it, it seems like. And then the second thing is, without getting into the constitutionality of 
uh, the VRA, are, would any of this, would these uh, reallocations be subject to the VRA? Um, no, I, I mean, VRA, you're talking about the Voting Rights Act? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, well, um, California is in the compact, and that's a pre-clearance state. Um, so, um, and, and the truth is, is a Voting Rights Act act within the states. I mean, all uh, we're not we're not abridging anybody's right to vote, right? We're actually encouraging people to vote more by making every vote count. Um, so, uh, we have given we've been given preclearance by DOJ under the Voting Rights Act based on the 55 electoral votes in California, sort of moving into the compact. The first question was. Faithless electors. Um, well, uh, states, that's, a, that's an issue for the states to deal with. I would say that there's been uh, 14 faithless electors uh, in the history of our country. Only one of them did it on purpose with the intent of sort of making a difference. His name was Samuel Miles back in the 1800s. Um, the truth is, is the national popular vote, um, you know, even if you had 270 exactly in the compact, um, you know, by definition, you'd be picking up a bunch of states on their um, state-based winner-take-all um, uh, rules. Um, because you've won the national popular vote. So you would have an inflated result in the Electoral College in a very real way. Um, so there's some protection there. But, you know, states, um, there's, uh, I think, uh, almost a dozen states that have faithless elector laws. Um, some of them have trapdoor provisions, and that's a state matter that, uh, you know, states are free to deal with. Um, if you think uh, faithless electors are a problem, they're a problem under the current system as well. So They're not as much of a problem under the current system because, as you point out rightly in your website, there's party discipline that largely holds it. But I would also add that once the election is clear, people are, as electors, responding to the democratic will. The faithless problem comes in terms of the different political officers who are chief elections state officials. In close elections, there will be strong temptations for them not to be faithful even to the compact. That's just in response to that question. To me, it's a sub-issue, the more important issues I've already addressed. So um, a couple of things. First of all, there will be partisan slates of electors under national popular vote, right? Um, if, if in North Carolina, for example, um, Barack Obama wins North Carolina, but Governor Romney uh, wins um, the popular vote. It would be Republican electors that would go and cast their ballot. It would be the Republican slate. So we wouldn't be forcing Democrats in, uh, in states where Obama won um, to cast their electoral vote. So, you know, the partisan loyalty would exist in both systems. So faithless electors is not a bigger problem under national popular vote. If you're concerned about it, it's the same problem. Um, we'd also have an inflated result. No, the more important problem is you're having the losers <laughs> elect and cast the electoral votes in that state. That's the real fundamental problem. Yeah, but you have you have electors for influence and not for identity. Frankly, I don't know anybody. I haven't met any of my Republican friends in Louisiana that were throwing parties on December 15th because the Republican electors got to go to the Capitol in Louisiana. They were all not looking forward to a second term from Barack Obama. Um, so the idea that we have electors for our political identity, um, I think, is misguided, wrong, and not grounded it's, in it's historical not, fact. It's not the political identity. It's the people of the state. The, a majority in the state votes for candidate X, and the, the, that majority is denied awarding the electoral votes to that winning candidate in that state. Well, public opinion would show that 75% of the voters on average would prefer that their electors support the popular vote winner, not the winner of their state. So the idea that there would be some sort of insurrection, chaos, and civil war around that I reject and think is wrong. Let's get some more questions. Over here. It seems like one of the, the main uh, purposes behind this is to encourage uh, uh, candidates to run more in other states. But you're still going to have this problem of candidates are going to concentrate their resources. Now, it won't be a, we're going to concentrate them in the purple state, but it'll be, we'll concentrate it in the major cities. So you'll see a lot of, a lot more advertising in, say, New York and L.A. and San Francisco, and you're not going to see any advertising going to Bismarck or Grand Forks because there's just not enough people to, to warrant the advertising yeah. there. 
No, no, I, I mean, I think cam campaigns are still going to make resource decisions, if that's the nature of your question. It's the first thought I had, won't they just hunker down in, you know, major metropolitan areas and media markets? It, it sort of ignores political demography, though, right? Because if you add up the population in the, in, in the 50 largest cities, for example, it's less than 15 percent of the vote. Um, and if you're going to spend all of your money in the New York and Philadelphia media market, which aren't as efficient, it's more expensive than to reach voters in the Fargo-Moorhead market, both markets that I've bought before, um, you know, I think you're going to squander a lot of resources. So the truth is, is that 85 percent of this country lives in suburban, rural, and exurban communities. And in my home state of Minnesota, for example, Tim Pawlenty was elected and re-elected governor twice, right? And he never won Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, Mankato, or Duluth. Those are the five largest cities. George Pataki was the governor of New York and re-elected governor of the state of New York and never won New York, any of the boroughs, Syracuse, Schenectady, Buffalo, or any of the big cities in the state of New York. So no, just it, when you do your political demography, you will realize that big cities aren't as big as they are, and that frankly, voters everywhere, including North Dakota, count in a first-past-the-post system. But that's going on the, the current model. If the model changes, then you're going to see a lot more effort to get out the vote in the bigger cities, and then you're going to see I mean, it, would you ever give a just excuse me? Would you ever give a candidate the advice that he should run by ignoring eighty-five percent of the voters? No, but you'll definitely. Then you answered your own question. Well, when I debated this at Tulane, it was against a professor who was from Germany, and he was taking much the same position. But he had to admit that in Germany, which had a closer a system closer to what's being advocated, that yes, they did concentrate on the big cities. You know, t the more we go towards a national campaign, which we're very much there, you change the map. And your point about changing strategies is, is exactly that. Politicians, uh, being advised by very mm -hmm. talented people like Pat, will, adv will look at what the parameters are, and they will gauge the strategy based on that. That was one of my points about withdrawal and when you could withdraw even legitimately in early May, because that throws the whole thing up. If, if you had... If, if one state withdrew and that was enough to throw the whole thing up and no longer be valid, you've scrambled the deck in mid-May, early May, and now there has to be a new strategy everywhere around. Well, and, and if, if, that, if that example happens, I mean, the compact obviously deals with that in a non-chaotic way. Anytime the compact dips below 270, all states revert back to their previous statute. So, I mean, making those decisions, you know, um, there's no provision in here that says they revert back. Yeah, yes, it does. It says it's explicitly in the compact. You'd have to, uh, you'll have to re uh, go back and look at that. Um, because when we dip below 270 on or below, before July 20th of a presidential year, which is just before the national conventions, we black out your period for withdrawal for six months, simply because you cannot change the rules in the middle of a game. But if at any time before July 20th we dip below 270, all compacting states revert back to their old statutes and we go back to a winner-take-all system. But it doesn't change. I mean, look, uh, New Yorkers, for example, sent $94 million in 2008 to John Kerry and, 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 and George Bush. You know, $94 million. They got exactly $6,750 spent on TV in the state of New York. You know, the idea that going to a national popular vote will not spread out the campaigning and end the system where various states are exporters of political economy, um, you know, I think is a matter of theory and not a matter of practice. Well, let me ask you about this because you've now just set it up. Suppose we have in one election the compact works. Mm -hmm. Then the next election the compact doesn't work because somebody's withdrawn. In the next election, then what happens? Can we go back into the compact? Sure. I mean, okay. states are free through their sovereign vote to go in and out of the compact okay, any time that they'd like. Okay. Now, people like you who want a national vote for president, aren't you going to get frustrated if we're going back and forth between sometimes it's, it's the compact and sometimes it's not? No, Won't I, people like you want to say, look, this is too chaotic. We've got to have a complete, clear national popular vote. Look, I think we make decisions based on what the system is for electing candidates. For, for example, in 2000, it's something you like to talk about, right? And I think it's appropriate to talk about it, and this is, this is real stuff. But in 2000, we spent more state, we spent more money in the state of Florida in the last uh, 60 days of the campaign than 42 other states combined. Under national popular vote, that wouldn't happen. 
Now, my strategy would change on the basis of what the system is. I don't believe that states are going to come in because they want to have and maximize their influence on the President of the United States. And it's not so much about where the money's spent. It's about the fact that, you know, Matthew Dowd, when we were running for re-election, right, when President Bush was running for re-election, he pulled in just 18 states the last 38 months of his first term. That means 32 states were not pulled by the President of the United States to figure out what was important to them because there was no way they could be competitive. Okay, so it's not just about where the campaign cash gets spent and it's not just about the visits, but the idea that more voters won't matter under a national popular vote because everybody would focus on Los Angeles and New York simply is not a real sort of idea or statement. It is impossible because you would be giving advice for a candidate to ignore 85% of the people. Now, if legislatures go in and out of the national popular vote, I think they're appropriately using their state power to do so. I don't expect them to do that. One last question. Was the popular state vote considered as opposed to popular national vote? You mean as a title of the organization or in terms of a system? In terms of the system. Well, the current system is a state-by-state -state popular vote system, right? It's where 48, 48 states operate under a winner-take-all rule, and I did not do a good enough job explaining this. Um, 48 states right now award their electors on the basis of who wins the popular vote in their states. It's not the founder system. That's a system we started moving to, frankly, when Madison and Jefferson determined they didn't want another Adams to steal an elector, and they went to the unit rule in Virginia because they're good political hacks, and they're also good philosophers, but they're very smart. And so New York responded in kind, and Hamilton didn't love the idea, but he got on board because he knew it was important for the state of New York and their influence. So currently we have a system, and that's why we have a bad system, where we have 48 states that operate on a winner-take-all rule, which says if you're not a moderate, you know, sort of like evenly divided state, I don't even know if that means moderate, but an evenly divided state, you know, you get no attention, you get no visits, you're not polled. I don't think there's been a voter polled by an American president in the state of Utah for the last 100 years. But still, when the bottom line comes down, you're saying that Nash, a national majority will trump the state majority. And to argue that that somehow promotes federalism and the power of the states is simply an upside down argument. But to, but to, argue, at, but to argue in any way that the reason we have an electoral college is so that the vote would represent, the electors would represent the popular vote of the state is absolutely false I and, never and wrong. Argue. I didn't argue so, that. I said uh, it was to leave, as you pointed out, the way it's drafted, is to leave the power in each state. The whole idea was that each state is a separate political community. We are not one no. massive national no. community. The whole thrust of the Federalist is to break up majorities and to break up factions and to multiply factions so that the factions check each other. The last thing that Madison want or Hamilton wanted was one national faction. Look. Too many third world countries that claim to be democratic, this is what they have. A majority grabs power and they crush their opponents. This is not a system to protect us against the presidency. There are all kinds of checks within our system built in and you have to study the whole thing to understand how it works. Hey, look, we don't have to worry about what you think it says. We know what it says and the founders left the method to the legislature, not the state. They left mind. any method to the legislature, and it had nothing to do with majorities or not majorities. Uh, sure they were, no, 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 they were moot on method because they couldn't agree to dictate terms to the states. And so national popular votes simply asked legislatures if they'd like to exercise their plenary power to make their states more powerful in the interest of providing a check on the president, pure and simple. Have, Without the consent of Congress under the Compacts Clause, they don't have that power. If they get to the number, we will litigate it. But I hope we don't get to the number because it'll be a mess. So I, I would hang on just one second one because I would also say that not a uh, uh, congressional consent has never been, nor is it a precondition to consider a state compact. Since Folks, it was a precondition. Okay. There'll be litigation afterwards. Just Thank like you, you both said. for joining us today. We might continue this debate out in the hallway perhaps there's a class coming in but I want to thank you both for joining us I think it was a great debate